In, uh, in Afghanistan, in our time at combat, there was a great deal of change in the way that we treated vascular trauma, much of a shift towards a damage control approach, both pre hospitally with more aggressive use of tourniquets and interoperatively with uh, temporary intervascular shunts and techniques of that nature. But it's a very different population in Afghanistan versus back in North America. And uh, our American colleagues, Colonel DeBose and uh, some of his civilian colleagues, began the Prove It Registry, which you may be aware of, to uh, the Prospective Observational Vascular Injury, injury uh, and Treatment Registry to prospectively look at vascular injury and how it's treated in America Level 1 and Level 2 trauma centers. But just as the, our experience in combat is different than our, uh, the population in North America, there are some significant differences between uh, our American colleagues and what we might find in uh, our Level 1 uh, trauma center in London, Ontario, uh, both in trauma systems as well as population. So we looked uh, retrospectively first over a five-year period to look at our vascular trauma experience so we could compare it to the Prove-It Registry. So as this registry continues to accrue and for have uh, uh, give us information, we'll know how to apply that to our institution. With regard to demographic, they're remarkably similar. Both having a mean age of 40 uh, for, uh, for the, the victims, both having 70% male. The mean uh, injury severity score was 21 for both centers. But as one might expect, in London, there was uh, less penetrating trauma than might be seen in uh, the American registry, with more likelihood of having a gunshot wound in the United States, whereas more likely to have a stabbing for penetrating trauma in London. But if we look at uh, if we look at the injuries, there were 127 patients that we saw over that five-year period. The distribution was was similar to our American colleagues, with 20% being in the neck, 20% being in the thorax, 20% in the abdomen, and uh, then 40% in the periphery, in the arms and legs, extremities. That's where the first difference really was in terms of our treatment uh, pre-hospitally. The likelihood of getting a, 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 getting a tourniquet application in a pre-hospital environment was much lower with our people. Of the 49 patients that had arterial injuries of the upper or lower extremity that could be amenable to tourniquet, only six were applied pre-hospitally over that five-year period in London. And of those six, only one, unfortunately, had recorded the time of application for that tourniquet, whereas our American colleagues uh, had 20% application of uh, tourniquets for extremity arterial injuries. Also, the philosophy or approach with regard to trying to deal with these uh, injuries was slightly different. So there was only one patient of the 127 that had a damage control approach for a vascular injury. The vast majority were treated with definitive operative repair at the time of uh, their initial surgery, which again, in keeping with having no intravascular shunt use at all during that five-year period, despite there obviously being the availability of impromptu shunts as well as prefabricated shunts in our hospital, none were used. And one interesting thing, or why maybe this is the case, that there's a different philosophy towards treating vascular trauma, is who's doing it. So in London, 13 different disciplines were involved in the treatment of vascular trauma, vascular trauma patients, with vascular surgeons being the most common, but only three of those 127 uh, patients being treated by a uh, general surgeon with a trauma fellowship. So this might be different than American Trauma Center that may have a, uh, a traumatologist, a trauma surgeon uh, in-house or available for, their, for treatment of their patients. This, uh, our environment for treating vascular trauma is quite different. So from this, I think there's a few things that in our Star Center that are quite useful for us to know. Firstly, that potentially there's room for us to improve with regard to our tourniquet use. Uh, that, and if we are to use tourniquets, it's important with accurate recording of the time of application. Also, that uh, if there are to be changes in the way that we do vascular trauma or if we, anything comes out of our proven, uh, uh, the proven experience that we'd like to apply, there are going to be a number of players in our London Centre that will have to be involved in, in those discussions uh, because of how many people are involved in treating vascular trauma in our Canadian Centre. But one interesting thing is the mortality between the two was identical statistically. 9% in our centre, 12% in Prove It. Uh, there wasn't a difference. So that's what we found by looking back retrospectively in our vascular trauma experience and comparing it to the published American data. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Dr. Smith, for a, a very good talk and for keeping it on time. Any questions?
None have come up online? No? Okay, good. Thanks, you. Uh, our next uh, paper will be case reports utilizing the IT clamp to control pre-hospital cranial maxillofacial injury by none other than Dr. Andrew Kirkpatrick. What was your previous rank? Sorry? Wait, what was your previous rank? Are you a major? I'm still a major. St no. Still a major, Dr. Yeah, Andrew major. Kirkpatrick. My apologies. All the uh, young majors are presenting now. Um, is there a way to control the slides? Yes. It should be a button up there. Oh, just, uh, okay, the button, sorry. Hey, uh, Andy Kirkpatrick, it's my pleasure to discuss a hands-free option in pre-hospital hemorrhage control for controlling cranial maxillofacial hemorrhage that I believe may illustrate a niche for this approach to topical hemorrhage control. So my disclosures are that I have consulted for the Acelity Corporation and especially for the Innovative Trauma Care Corp, who's the manufacturer of this device, and I have a personal relationship with a company member. So quickly and efficiently treating bleeding wounds is a critical capability because they're so frequent and it can affect almost anybody. In 2005, nearly 12 million wounds were treated in the emergency department, of which 7.3 million were lacerations. Many are minor. Lots, though, occur in terrible situations, such as during combat, and some are devastating and fatal. Cranial maxillofacial or CMF injuries are a frequent subset with the distinction of having major, many major vascular structures in proximity. So the purpose of this review is therefore to discuss a hands-free option to control many of these bleeding wounds using a simple hemorrhage control device. The IT clamp is a self-locking hemostatic clamp with eight needles that penetrate the skin to evert the edges between pressure bars. Pressure is evenly distributed, distributed across the bars, which seal the skin over the wound. This action may stop the bleeding by creating a temporary contained hematoma, which may constitute definitive therapy or be temporizing until definitive surgical repair. If wound packing is performed prior to wound clamping, the results are even better. The data from this report was obtained as part of Innovative Trauma Care's post-market surveillance program, where cases are voluntarily collected on IT clamp use. The use of the IT clamp for treatment was there for, uh, for uh, cranial maxillofacial injury specifically was extracted from all the post-market surveys, and a descriptive analysis was applied. From September 2013 to December 2015, 216 cases of IT clamp use were reported. And this uncontrolled sample suggests that cranial maxillofacial facial injuries are remarkably common. 80 cases of 37% of all reports were to control cranial maxillofacial facial injuries. Of these 80 cases, the majority 75 were for scalp hemorrhage and five were for facial hemorrhage. Falls and motor vehicle crashes accounted for 61% of the mechanisms of injury. In terms of real-world efficacy, 9% of cases reported the need to reapply the IT clamp, with 86% of the time adequate hemorrhage control being reported on the second application. It's particularly notable, I believe, that direct pressure and packing was abandoned in favor of the IT clamp in more than a quarter, or 28% of cases, emphasizing the attractiveness of freeing the responders' hands for other activities. For the bottom line, adequate hemorrhage control was reported in 88% of cases, but for complete dispo disclosure, three respondents reported inadequate hemorrhage control, and for seven cases, actually, the hemorrhage control status was not reported. So to conclude, as we know, cranial maxillofacial facial injuries are common. Current options like direct manual oppression often do not work well and are formidable to maintain on long transports, especially in care under fire situations where the responders need to use their hands for many other activities, not the least of which may be defending their own lives. This case series suggests that the IT clamp may be considered a hands-free alternative or adjunct to direct compression to control exsanguination from cranial maxillofacial facial injuries both in civilian and military settings. Limitations as a study are notable and include all the biases of retrospective and uncontrolled case series, 
including no direct comparison to other control adjuncts, but I think it's still interesting data. So thank you for the opportunity. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Dr. Kirkpatrick. Any questions at all? I have one question from the web. Is this better than quickly stapling? Than quickly stapling? Yeah, using a staple gun. Any better? Um, I, I maybe not explain just the, maybe explain what really the IT clamp, how it works. Yeah, I more. mean, well, the IT clamp is like a, like a medical bread clip. I, I hate to get in trouble for, uh, but that's the simplest thing. Like a big hair clip, it has eight pins. Um, it gets a good, it, uh, you know, I don't have the number of pounds torque, but it gets a good uh, pressure seal. It's very quick and effective. Um, I believe it, it would be quicker than stapling, and I believe it would hold more the edges closer together. That's uncontrolled, my opinion. And again, I, I'd be a strong advocate of that if you're, um, if I was using this, I would definitely want to pack the wound and then wound clamp it. And I think the more operational the setting, the more valuable the device. Um, we didn't have time to talk about it, but we've done a randomized controlled trial of, you know, of like the parachute of how well you could defend yourself with an M16 or a C7 if you had, uh, um, and obviously when you put a tourniquet on, you become completely defenseless. So I don't want to bleed to death, but if I don't need a tourniquet, I, with an IT clamp, you can still use your weapon to defend yourself. Whereas after 10 minutes, you, uh, the enemy could walk in and club you to death with your weapon. Okay. <laughs> so. Sir, might I ask about, uh, for tactile combat casualty care, for self-application of this device, how easily would that be able to do? And for portability, if I'm going to have that on my gear, on my web gear, if I'm in uh, a forward environment, is, that, is this piece of kit uh, easily handleable, easily self-applied, or is it strictly for a buddy care situation? No, I, I, I great. Um, thank you. It's very easily self-applied. I can put it on with one hand. I think the only reason you couldn't put it on with if you had no, no hands left um, but it, it's, it really is a one-hand device, so there's no point in having an extra hand. And absolutely, I think, um, you know, policemen and, uh, and mountain climbers, and the more the setting where you have to do self-care, I think it becomes more attractive. Thanks, sir. That's personal opinion. Excellent. Thank you very much. Uh, next paper will be Nursing Education for the Implementation of Reboa by Mr. William Morrissey. Right, thanks. Hello. Um, <clears throat> so this is a little different crowd than I'm used to talking to. There's not so many docs, usually it's more uh, nurses, but please bear with. Can I see the uh, English version of it? That's good. I can't see it here, though. I have some notes. That to... We've got it in Spanish. Okay, I can. I yeah. think I can change that. There you go. It should come up in English. Okay. So, as a quick background, um, give, you know, with the unpredictability of the trauma that we deal with at the medical center, I come from from Phoenix, Arizona, um, the county hospital. Um, we see a lot of different injuries and sometimes with these um, high acuity uh, procedures that are low frequency, we run into differences in what nursing uh, thinks that should be done during these procedures. If they're no, we're not familiar with the equipment, that sort of thing. So what we wanted to do was, with Reboa in particular, uh, with some of the surgeons using it more and more now, we wanted to bring everyone up to speed within the units uh, as far as our training goes. So small amount of literature really and education materials available for nursing. Uh, there's quite a bit for physicians, surgeons. Um, so what we did at Maricopa was we came up with an idea to uh, create a video to um, help nurses quickly access this, uh, but give them options to go to at different times while they have some downtime to review this. Uh, and we got together with education, one of our trauma surgeons and our nurse manager from the ED and we came up with a video that we made available. Uh, we identified two specific roles for nursing, one at the bedside and one, uh, as far as documentation goes, during our traumas, we have a scribe for both nursing and uh, physicians. 
Uh, so the, the basic uh, rules are the bedside nurse is available to get equipment, handle the catheter, set up the, the equipment for the physician who's inserting the, the catheter, and the scribe nurse will record our balloon time up the length of the catheter when it's inserted, uh, and these basic um, uh, just the, the basic information that's relayed to us while we're at the bedside. Um, for the hands-on demonstration that uh, Dr. Bogart came up with was we used a um, mannequin, had um, basic uh, equipment available that's there that we have available at the hospital, uh, and also having the nurses to understand the, the anatomy that's involved as well as the implication of when we would use this. Um, and then we were also given the power, if we needed to, to sort of um, advocate for the patient or um, anything else that might be going on in the room in a, in a sort of kind of crazy situation sometimes. Uh, when we, after we did our training, we rolled it out initially only for uh, ED and uh, SICU. And in that time frame, we had uh, six catheters that were placed over 23 weeks. In the same time, there were uh, also uh, four open ED thoracotomies. Uh, the medium length of stay that we noted was 30 minutes for patients with Reboa and about 48 minutes um, patients with open thoracotomy. After we looked at our documentation and whatnot, we didn't notice any um, real needs for change at that point. Um, and then moving down the road as we followed up, uh, most of the nurses felt pretty comfortable with the um, Reboa and the insertion and in assisting. And you can see the, what we did notice was the length of stay was a little bit shorter, and our mortality rate uh, was about 100% with open thoracotomies, 50% um, with patients with Reboa. Over time, we noticed that there was some uh, retraining needed as staff members either leave the critical care areas, new, new nurses come on board. Uh, so that's when we decided to sort of make it available. The uh, training video that we created, we put it up on the internet within the hospital, uh, and uh, many of the nurses were able to get the information that way. We've also gone around, teamed up with the vendors, had them also uh, come back quite a few times to train with our nursing staff. Uh, we did notice um, that we had one complication post-procedure, and that was in the ICU. We also had one indicated in a medical ICU, and we sort of overlooked that particular aspect of the Reboa catheter when we initially rolled out the training, so then we expanded our training to include all the critical care areas. Uh, most important thing that we've come up with is we need to make sure that um, we engage all the nursing staff and all the medical staff, especially the surgeons involved in placing Reboa. Um, it'll ultimately improve patient outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Great. Oh, hang on a sec there. We're going to have a few questions, maybe. Anyways, I'd just like to say that was a, a great talk and a, and a very important piece of education that's necessary, like in a high-stakes scenario, was something that, you know, we may not see all that often. And, and we see this often or fairly frequently in medicine and really how to focus that education to, so that this high-stakes scenario, things can run fairly smoothly, is, uh, is exceptional. So... Uh First of all, congratulations on a great presentation and a, and a, uh, and a great topic. Um, I remember when I saw this abstract um, submitted, I thought how impressive it is to actually say, yeah, we should do organized education so that we can actually get this done. I think that that's a brilliant idea. Um, I have to ask you, how hard was it to implement this? Did you get much pushback from the nurses? Uh, no, I, actually, initially, most of the nurses that we dealt with didn't really have any idea what Reboa was. So uh, when we came on board, we kind of get people on board. You know, some of those people will jump right in and want to learn everything, and other people are uh, afraid of it. But once we started doing the training video and we showed, you know, statistic, statistically the, dif the difference it could make, um, pretty much everybody came on board very quickly at that point. Um, the, the biggest thing we overlooked were the outlying ICUs, the other ICUs where, you know, potentially they wouldn't see it as often. Uh, but. Okay. Were you using it for um, things other than trauma? Is that why the other ICUs were seeing it? Well, some of the patients uh, initially, um, that one patient had an, a renal injury, had been in for another procedure from the medical ICU, got into some trouble, and they 
surgeon that was on that night was a trauma surgeon who went upstairs to deal with the bleed and recognized the need, you know, that it could be impl implemented there. It was just that the staff wasn't quite sure of, of the setup of the equipment. Yeah, I can't wait to implement this at my facility, so thank you. Uh, one more question. What was the, I mean, I think I've, I got you sort of said the answer about the satisfaction from afterwards with the, the nurses, the feedback. They, you know, thought this video was fantastic and this has helped tons or? It's definitely helped, yeah. It, it gives access to something, like I said, where everyone kind of like, if, if you're not sort of in this small little mm -hmm. subset of people who know what this is, then everyone's kind of scratching their once. Whereas with our video, we gave a little breakdown of the anatomy, you know, all these things to show. And we also created a poster that we took around to all the ICUs, and then we went and did individualized training there as well with each of the nurses. Excellent. There's one question from uh, the internet here is, uh, where can we see this video? We want to uh, borrow it, perhaps. <laughs> well, it's on, our, it's on our intranet, but we also provided a link I believe. So the Maricopa Integrated Health System in Arizona. Right. That's, That's right. where we got to find it. There's a link there you can. Okay. Or Did if somebody you... wants to contact me at the hospital, I'd be happy to send it to them. Perfect. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next paper will be a Plan for Management of Intractable Pelvic Bleeding Due to Gunshot Injuries by Dr. Yasser Salim. Is he here? We have a video. Okay. Hello. I guess Good I'll afternoon, everybody. Press play. This is my pillar of the country, Egypt. We are talking about today about the plan for management of intractable pelvic bleeding due to gunshot injuries. Press play. The penetrating pelvic injury is one of the most difficult to trauma surgeons. Patients who have this condition have a high risk of visceral and vas vascular injury, including rectal, bladder, distal, ureter injury. Here we are presenting one patient presenting came with extensive gunshot injury of the pelvis causing fracture of the sacrum as we can see together with visceral and the vascular injury of the pelvis. So patient presented with extensive pelvic injury due to gunshot with severe shock. Management plan includes immediate laparotomy and bilateral ligation of the internal iliac artery uh, followed by exploration of pelvic hematoma where we found left internal iliac vein tour and we ligated it. Colostomy for, a rect for upper rectal injury added to the vascular control by ligation of the superior rectal artery. Here we can see in this uh, CT uh, film that there is extensive fracture of the pelvis of the sacral uh, bone with visceral injury together with vascular injury. Here this is a CT angio below, this is a CT angio showing the ligation of the internal iliac artery with distal, uh, there's good distal runoff after ligation because of good collaterals uh, for the internal iliac artery. The anatomy of the internal iliac artery, the branches of the internal iliac artery constitute the major blood supply to the pelvis. The only pelvic organ that does not receive its blood supply from the branches of the internal iliac artery is the superior part of the rectum. The internal iliac artery is about four centimeters long and originates at the level of the lumposacral joint from the bifurcation of the common iliac artery where it is crossed by the ureter, your end of the ureter. Subsequently, the internal iliac artery divides into anterior and the posterior trunk. So, the anterior division or anterior trunk of the internal iliac artery is mainly a visceral artery supplying the uh, urinary bladder, the uterus, the upper vagina in females, and the, the middle and the lower rectum by the middle and the inferior rectal arteries from the internal pudendal. The posterior branch, the posterior trunk is mainly or supplies mainly the parietes that gives the superior lateral arteries, gives it the lateral sacral artery, and so on. Rationale. The main underlying principle in ligation of the internal iliac artery for control of pelvic hemorrhage is the conversion of an arterial high pressure circulation into uh, venous low pressure circulation where coagulation mechanisms can work. Unilateral ligation of the internal iliac artery decreases the pulse pressure distal to the point of ligation by 77%. Why bilateral ligation decreases the pulse pressure by 85% because of the excellent collateral circulation in the pelvis, vascular compromise does not occur when one or both internal iliac arteries are ligated. 
the conclusion, we conclude that bilateral ligation of internal iliac arteries with colostomy is rapid and a safe procedure which can save lots of lives of patients with gunshot injuries to the injury to the pelvis. Just today, my dear, we have received one patient with gunshot pelvis and we demonstrated some video for ligation of the internal iliac artery to be followed after this slide. As we can see here, this is the internal iliac artery with uh, right angle forceps around it. Uh, with the bifurcation, clearly defined the bifurcation of the common iliac artery into the external and internal iliac. With the, the ureter can be seen on the medial side of the field, and I usually ligate it in continuity, means that I don't cut it. I usually make two ligatures and then uh, I don't cut in between, so it can maintain its uh, integrity and there is no risk of bleeding after division or after ligation, sorry, of the uh, internal iliac uh, artery. Here we are ligating this. This case just today, she, the patient came with a gunshot injury to the pelvis and immediately sent to, uh, to OR and where we uh, just opened the patient and found this uh, extensive injury, fracture of the iliac bone and injury to the pelvic viscera. Uh, so we just immediately were trying, we ligated this uh, uh, left internal recursor on the left side. So this, uh, uh, as we see, this is, we are going to ligate, good, and yes, thank you very much, thank you. I guess we can't have any questions. Um, so we will proceed on to our, our next uh, speaker, and we'll uh, be uh, injury profile suffered by targets of anti-personnel improvised explosive devices, a prospective cohort study. And we'll be seeing Dr. Major Shane Smith back up here. Thank you very much. The improvised explosive device killed and injured more Canadians in Afghanistan than any other weapon. It's uh, a bomb that's made uh, by the Taliban to detonate to hurt our soldiers. It's not fabricated in a factory. It's made by them in an improvised site. And as such, it's been described sometimes as an impromptu landmine. Now, the injury pattern of the anti-personnel landmine has been well described. Kuplin and Cover, uh, published in the 1990s about the injury pattern of the landmine, describing it as causing unilateral amp uh, amputation of the lower limb with less severe shrapnel injuries elsewhere. Their work in describing landmine injuries was important in the 1999 Ottawa Treaty, which banned landmine use in many countries. Now, the improvised explosive device for its injury pattern, in order to describe it, we looked at 100 sequential victims of this weapon that presented to a combat hospital in Kandahar. Now, like the landmine, the, this weapon's indiscriminate. So if a child comes across this weapon, steps on it, triggers it, they are equally subject to its, uh, to its injury. So there were 18 patients that, of our 100 that were of pediatric age injured by this weapon. Again, the mean age of these, of these uh, casualties was 25, as one might expect in uh, a fighting environment, and uh, they were entirely male, which is in keeping with sort of the cultural situation of the region as well as the male predominance of the fighting force. Now, although the mortality of this weapon is uh, 19%, that might be an underestimation because if local nationals triggered this weapon, our, uh, our combat hospital accepted all these, the casualties from the region, but they may not, if they were killed on site, be transported to us. But more than that, there were 70% of these patients had multiple limb amputations, and a third of them lost three or four limbs. It's a devastating uh, tool, a devastating weapon. And that upward force caused by this bomb also does a significant amount of injury to the pelvis and perineum. 21% of these casualties had pelvic fracture and 46% had significant pelvic, genital, and perineal injury. This is a radiograph where the pelvis has been disrupted, 
combat gauze has been pushed up uh, into the pelvis through a perineal defect by the combat medic. And you could also see the significant contamination of soil into the tissues by this dirty upward blast into these patients. It's a devastating injury. So the injury pattern of the anti-personnel improvised explosive device is in fact much worse than that of the anti-personnel landmine described by Kuplin and Cover. It's worse than a unilateral amputation with shrapnel injuries elsewhere. It causes multiple amputations and significant pelvic and perineal injury. This is important because it's going to allow us to think about what we can do about personal protective equipment. We're going to have to think about creative ways to try and protect the pelvis while still allowing soldiers to fight. We may have to consider ways to protect the arm or lower, especially on the non-dominant hand as they carry their weapon in low ready position, which is exposed to that blast as well as our combat medics at present don't carry pelvic binders with them very often on patrol. But I would suggest to you that if an IED victim has come across, if someone in your patrol is injured by this weapon, applying a pelvic binder to them in the field would be a prudent thing to do. The final thing that I think is important from this medical description is considering how we want to think about this weapon societally or from a jurist perspective. I would suggest this weapon inflicts uh, significant amount of and superfluous amount of harm and there have been some that would have considered the fact that this may in fact be a war crime to use this weapon. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Any questions for Dr. Smith? No? None online? Okay, thank you very much. Our next paper will be, uh, is entitled, A Dynamic Canadian Forces Medical Services slash Canadian Space Agency Sponsored Program to Facilitate Real-Time Telementoring Telediagnosis to Address Exsanguination in Austere Environments. Whew. And Dr. Major Andrew Kirkpatrick will be discussing this paper. We, uh, we just call it the DASR. Perfect. Why didn't you put that in the title then? <laughs> I don't know, I thought this was really, really formal. <laughs> but um, again, um, I want to thank and, congr thank and congratulate the organizers of this innovative surgical conference for their vision and leadership in surgical education. And therefore, it's my pleasure as well to present an overview of our program to examine real time telementored, telediagnosed care to try to prevent exsanguination in austere environments. This endeavor represents the collaboration of these various academic, government, scientific, and commercial entities that over time have supported our efforts at the University of Calgary with funding, donations in kind, operational support, including that of members of the audience, uh, Chad and Paul, among many other people. Um, my disclosures haven't changed from a few minutes ago, which is good. <laughs> um, I've consulted for a Celebi and Innovative Trauma Care. So our collaborative has focused on many questions, but I feel the most critical is remote hemorrhage control. As I think we all know, bleeding to death is the most prevent potentially preventable cause of post-traumatic death in the world, both in hospitals, on the battlefield, on our highways, and most casualties die before ever reaching a surgeon. And for example, the most recent reports from the Near East conflicts confirmed that most fatalities occur prior to arrival at any medical treatment facility, and again, most are due to non-compressible torso hemorrhage. There's certainly been progress in many areas, though, and with dedication to quality and a renewed emphasis on tourniquet availability and use, extremity exsanguination can be nearly, if not completely, avoided. And as well, as Dr. Holcomb spoke this morning, there's been tremendous advances in trauma resuscitation in the last decade in avoiding compounding an intrinsic injury-related coagulopathy. But however, there's been little in addressing catastrophic bleeding in austere and far forward settings from these non-compressible sites. And thus our program has attempted to address, at least address some of the questions and challenges to potentially rescue a few more catastrophically bleeding patients far forward. Iterative phases of this program have included looking at the remote diagnosis with portable ultrasound of non-compressible torso hemorrhage, 
followed by remotely mentored non-invasive therapies such as ultrasound guided vascular compression. Even more effort is focused on remotely mentored surgical interventions including damage control packing in the pre-hospital arena by non-surgeons. And, and we've also examined extreme environments such as damage control surgery and weightlessness. And finally, and maybe more important, how to measure and mitigate the stress on the provider caused by such extreme activities. So just a few examples of this remote mentoring approach include in the top upper left, a randomized trial of mentoring firefighters in Edmonton to diagnose major hemoperitoneum with portable ultrasound when guided from Calgary, Nanaimo, BC, and even Tennessee. Another in the bottom is remotely guiding medics in Israel to place chest tubes on a mannequin when mentored by a panel of surgeons from Canada and Australia, providing redundancy across the time zones. Thanks, Paul. On the top right is mentoring a firefight in Memphis from Calgary to use portable ultrasound to identify and subsequently compress the acute pseudoaneurysm of a femoral artery injury. And in the bottom right is an example of remotely guiding medics from a, another building to perform damage control laparotomies on a simulation of torso exsanguination in Ottawa. And so although time does not permit a detailed review of our, all our findings, we do ultimately and strongly conclude that with remote mentoring, I believe we can support the pre-hospital diagnosis of exsanguination and this may allow more effective non-invasive and maybe even invasive damage control interventions to potentially rescue those exsanguinating in far forward and extreme environments. And I believe all these approaches should be more rigorously studied with the goal to actually operationalize techniques. And as personal communication becomes normal and every soldier, policeman and first responder wears a camera with two-way communication, I believe it behooves trauma providers to keep up with the technology to be ready to mentor those willing providers to extend hemorrhage control forward to the places where more, most victims actually bleed to death. And I also believe that remote mentoring will become a sub-discipline of medicine and it de deserves to be studied as a freestanding scientific body of knowledge. So again, thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, Andy. Any questions? None online? Okay. Thank you very much. Our last uh, paper will be entitled uh, Contemporary Outcomes of Blunt Popliteal Artery Injury, a Propensity Matched Analysis of the National Trauma Data Bank by Dr. John Fuchko. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'd just like to... Uh, Thank the committee for allowing us to come and present our results on our propensity matched analysis on uh, outcomes in trauma patients presented with blunt popliteal artery injury. Uh, we have no disclosures. <clears throat> popliteal artery injury is a rare but devastating complication of lower extremity trauma. While there's a higher incidence of PAI and penetrating injury with amputation rates ranging from 20 to 60 percent, these tend to be more common in blunt trauma. <clears throat> uh, this is typically seen in blunt trauma because blunt trauma compared to penetrating trauma has a higher uh, transmission of force. Uh, while there have been previous studies of blunt PAI outcomes, these studies tended to group together uh, blunt and penetrating trauma. Uh, we sought to improve analysis by not only solely focusing on blunt trauma, but by performing propensity matching to reduce rates of selection bias. Our goal is to identify factors associated with amputation and mortality. This was a retrospective review of prospectively collected data from the National Trauma Data Bank. For those who are unfamiliar, it's an American College of Surgeons maintained database of information from trauma centers across the United States. And it currently contains information over 5 million patients. We initially identified patients using ICD-9 codes, and on initial run-through we had over 5,000 patients. However, after excluding for age, uh, mortality within 24 hours, or death on arrival, we had an end of a little over 3,000. <coughs> We initially looked at over 60 variables, many of which were uh, taken from the Trauma Quality Improvement Program, uh, and using chi-squared analysis looked to see which of those variables had or trended toward a significant relationship with amputation. 
Those variables were then used in univariate analysis to create propensity matched amputation and non-amputation patient cohorts. Each cohort contained 362 patients, and our primary endpoints were amputation and mortality. As you can see from our initial chi-squared analysis, those patients who presented hypotensive or tachycardic tended to undergo amputations. The same is also true for patients who presented with femur fracture or concurrent popliteal vein or tibial nerve injury. Uh, of note, there were two variables not listed that were also significant. Uh, time to intervention was not found to be different between the two groups. However, injury severity score was found to be elevated in patients who underwent amputation. We then performed a univariate propensity matched analysis, and it demonstrates that those, I don't know if you can see it, but those three uh, variables in red, diabetes, popliteal vein injury, and tibial nerve injury, were all had statistically significant increased odds of amputation. In particular, tibial nerve injury was associated with almost a four times likelihood of amputation. These variables were made significant on multivariate analysis. Again, tibial nerve injury showing almost a four times likelihood. Uh, what's interesting to note is that diabetes, while not significant on initial chi-squared analysis, was found to be significant on propensity-matched groups. It's possible that diabetes is either a marker of pre-existing peripheral arterial disease or an overall marker of poor health. What's also interesting is that while injury severity score was found to be significant on initial chi-squared analysis, it was not found significant on propensity, match, uh, propensity matching. Uh, we then turned our attention to mortality and found that uh, age between 56 and 65 and injury severity score were found to have statistically significant odds of, of mortality uh, while in-house. So in conclusion, trauma patients who sustained blunt popliteal artery injury at an increased risk for amputation. There were several limitations to this study. It was retrospective, and it was dependent on the National Trauma Data Bank, which itself is a descriptive uh, data bank dependent on pooled entries. Uh, using propensity matching, we found that both popliteal vein and tibial nerve injury, as well as diabetes, but not injury severity score, predicted limb loss. And both age and injury severity score were predictors of mortality. Going forward, we'd like to uh, perform the same level of analysis looking at penetrating injury. We'd also like to investigate the role of different intervention types and outcomes, especially given newer endovascular technologies available today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Notrika and Dr. Ree are getting up. So um, did you have the ability to, to sort out um, the, the patients who had an attempted salvage versus those who had a primary uh, amputation? Mm -hmm. and, what, and what was your failure rate of the attempted salvage? My it's, it's, it's a great question. It's very difficult, unfortunately, with the, uh, the National Trauma Data Bank to, to look at attempted salvages. We can try to see that I think about 80 to 90, I think if I remember back to the initial data that we had, in, I think an 80 to 90 had an either endovascular or open intervention. Uh, as far as the details of the intervention, it's also difficult to obtain. We don't know, you know, it says there's a bypass, and that's kind of the amount that we have, so we can't tell what, what kind of bypass it is, or if there was an endovascular inter intervention, was it a stent, was it just a, uh, an angio, and it was a failed angio, so unfortunately that's a, a major limitation. But something we'd like to look at our own, uh, you know, speaking with my colleagues, we'd like to look at our own hospital to see what our, our own results are, just to make it a little easier. And so similarly on that vein, just with the popliteal vein injury, it's just an injury. You don't know if it was repaired, ligated, or anything. Exactly. You can sometimes see if something is ligated or not, but then you're also depending on if it, it being recorded properly. Sure. Dr. Ree. I was going to ask you that same question about the vein, <laughs> <laughs> because uh, I was taught, you know, from an earlier age, from uh, uh, due to the Vietnam trauma, vascular trauma registry about the popliteal vein, how important that vein is, and mm -hmm. you should repair it whenever you can because uh, of the limb salvage rate is so poor, right. up to 70 percent. So the data bank doesn't really give you that much information, except for whether it's injured or not, or whether it's just what's what, what, what all can you get from a, a venous injury? A lot of it is depend on interventional codes. So you can see if someone had an open or endovascular intervention. But a lot of it is sort of, you have to take, it's a little bit intuitive because it'll say like if there's a bypass or if there's an endovascular attempt, it'll say if there's a vessel ligation. Sometimes they call it just other vessel ligation. So you don't necessarily know if that's what they're talking about when they mention that someone comes in with a mangled extremity. But of course they have blunt trauma, so they may have injuries to somewhere else and you see other vessel ligation, and you wonder, is that a popliteal vein, or is that another vessel that they're just, uh, they're just mentioning? Thank you.
telling you the magnitude of the of the injury, even separate from what you can get in the IIS, kind of tell you, tell you that it was more force and more magnitude of the injury, and that's how we concluded from that. Uh, you can see if they attempted to repair, but it's, the code doesn't tell you if it was one single stitch, if it was ligated, and it's very difficult to differentiate. But thank you for that question. Okay, any other questions? All right, thank you. I guess that will conclude uh, the first day of uh, TCI 2017.